Madaba is great. Here's the thing, it actually kind of reminds me of my city, of Kraków, for example, when it comes to the, um, let's call it the old town, the town center. It is pretty much like back home, a little nice maze of streets which are basically for pedestrians and yes, they are full of typical souvenir shops and typical touristic restaurants, but it doesn't mean that there is no charm there most definitely is. Plus, back 20-30 years ago, parts of the old town in Kraków were still derelict and here you will find such derelict houses as well. So it kind of reminded me of home. Plus, today if you have such buildings, very often there is going to be some street art. And of course Vicky went off the rails looking for street art, doors, handles, all those little artistic details which are hidden in plain sight. So not only mosaics, we did have time for something else. Plus, during the night you need to rest a bit. So we would find a nice restaurant or cafeteria. But here you are truly never away from history. You will leave a cafeteria like this and you will find walls which may even have 3000 years because in Madaba we are not in Amon anymore, we are in the ancient kingdom of Moab. Actually, there are quite a lot of places around Madaba where you will have something related to the kingdom of Moab, most of the map you're seeing now, for example. Unfortunately, no time to visit any of them. So, in a museum or another, I did find a photo or two. Well, here they are from those places we could not visit and later we will cover in some extra detail an important artifact or two but for now this is it we are going to say goodbye to Madaba and off we go we are going to go down the King's Road it existed already 3000 years ago connecting today's Syria through some places we already visited like Philadelphia, Madaba of course, through the kingdom of Moab all the way down to the Red Sea. What you're actually seeing right now is the version from the ancient Roman Empire from 2000 years ago called Via Traiana Nova, starting in Bosra in modern Syria all the way down to Aqaba and the Red Sea. So pretty much that's what we're gonna do now. And today it is known for views and panoramas. Basically think of the east, um, the hills in the east of the Dead Sea as bread that somebody started cutting through. So you will have every now and then little versions of the Grand Colorado Canyon. So yes, canyons are there and not really little. We are entering right now, I think the most famous or one of the most famous ones, we are entering Wadi Mujib. And as you most probably noticed already, we were not lucky with the weather. It's raining, it's foggy, so I mean the views are still fantastic as you see, but um, Although the word fantastic is already kind of high, I would say with some good weather and sun, they would be more fantastic still. So um, a bit of a disappointment, but hey, what can you do? At least they did have some dobra herbata. In Polish we found good tea. It always helps during weather like that. This is actually not the last surprise when it comes to um, provisions that we had in Wadi Mujib. But now let's roll through it, you will see some Bedouin. Well, till the very day, people who live there very often live half nomadic life. Still, pastoralism is a big deal here. So you will see that. What we won't see because of the weather are the tourists. There are supposedly plenty of very nice uh, walking trails around. And from time to time, that's what you would see. Back in the day, it was part of Via Traiana Nova, so such columns are supposedly still to find. But what we find is a huge dam. If you have a wadi, which sometimes has flash floods in order to control it, you build a dam, which of course makes perfect sense. And now on the other side of the canyon, you will see it 
perfectly. The dam itself plus a little lake which it created behind. But here, that's not the highlight. The highlight is this kind of a barrack or shed. Well, first of all, it does have a little terrace with the views we saw a moment ago. But once again, this is not the highlight. Let's have a look for a moment inside this barrack shed, whatever that would be. Because what you're about to enter right now is the best restaurant in Jordan. And there's a very nice old school saying, do not judge the book by the cover. It may look like it's barracks, but this is the food. And it looks awesome. And I think it will also taste awesome. It, it is really cool. This is a very small place that we just found on the road. And these guys, we don't even know where the kitchen is, but they have prepared something that is amazing. Um, with all these details, even the way they, they, they displayed all the, the vegetables, it's unbelievable. You should see this place. Where we are now, you wouldn't believe that you can get this. So, local, 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 truly local. So I guess now it is clear. It wasn't a joke, there was no sarcasm in it. This is the best restaurant in Jordan. Truly wonderful food, great display, fantastic views. But in the end, the most important, those two guys who run the place a bit of creativity a big smile and we will never forget this experience still we need to keep on rolling so let's continue down the king's road and a number of interesting details it is raining yes but thanks to that you will have on the way some colors you maybe wouldn't expect a green and yellow also, you will notice in some places, wind there is a bit of a typical thing. Those little trees, I think they know what, uh, what I'm talking about. And of course, every now and then, you will have another canyon with some fantastic views again. But guess what? A bit of history, in the end, I will have to add. Because all around us are plenty of little archaeological sites. We are not going to visit any of them, but let me tell you about the most important thing they found in the old um, kingdom of Moab. Just north of Wadi Mujib, in Theban, which was 3000 years ago the capital of the kingdom, they found something called today the Mesha Stel, which is basically a huge stel made of basalt, it's more than one meter high, and in Paleo-Hebraic alphabet, in the Old Moabite language, Mesha, king of Moab, tells you about his great victories against Israel. It is an extremely important artifact for a number of reasons. First of all, the longest continuous text from 3000 years ago from the so-called Iron Age found in the Levant. Secondly, it confirms some stories from the Old Testament as the rebellion of Mesha against the Kingdom of Israel is also, from the Jewish point of view, told in the Old Testament, hence the stel confirms parts at least of the Old Testament are historically valid, plus for the first time outside of the Old Testament you will find the name of the Hebrew God Yahweh. And if you're wondering where the basalt came from, every now and then within the surrounding limestone you will have such a hill made of basalt. What you saw a moment ago, the stel is from the museum in Amman, but it's not an original, it's a copy. The original is in the Louvre in Paris. But I guess you notice in the meantime, the ambience is changing, it's becoming more and more desolate. And our idea was to reach before sunset a village called Dana, which is gate to one of the most popular wadis. Let's walk around a bit, let's have some nature and then milk has spilled. Not only fog, but it started raining heavily, so we couldn't go fast, which means we could not reach the village before sunset. So it got dark, plus it kept on raining and the fog was still there. There was a moment where we couldn't practically see anything. We were afraid we will have to spend the night somewhere on the road, because if you cannot see anything and you saw the roads, they were narrow and windy. Fortunately, 
Vicky is a champion of driving, so we did manage to reach the village in the end. But the stress of the last one or two hours, especially that Vicky had to go through, and the next day. Welcome to the beautiful nature reserve Dana, or actually to the little village, which is kind of the gate to it. And uh, here's the problem, it is 6-7 degrees and we are in the middle of a cloud, so my views are like this which means zero and none and it is rather unfortunate because the idea was to first of all hang around the little village you can see the beautiful stone cottages there's actually an interesting modern story to them and then hit the road down the wadi to um, to enjoy a hike in nature well that is not going to happen so unfortunately only a couple of things about the village, which we can do, and then uh, no, no worry, we are going away from here uh, looking for sun. And here in front of you is the village. It's kind of a promontory of rock over the wadi with some 40 50 cottages built on top of it, and the people here as usual around would live mostly from pastoralism and a bit of agriculture but then in the 60s and they asphalted the main road which is just above the village and people started moving to a modern town which was built right next to the road 30 years later late 80s there are only a couple of villagers here mostly older people and they still lived without such modern basics as electricity or um, canalization, so modern toilets. But it is also late 80s where a group of people from Amman were looking for traditional villages. They came here, they saw an abandoned village which is very traditional next to a beautiful canyon pretty much unspoiled by modernity. So straight up they created a bio reserve around the village in the canyon basically and then they decided to kind of start let's call it a social experiment they decided first of all to ban grazing by sheep or goats which was actually a big deal for the locals but then whatever they grow like fruit or nuts that would be bought and turned into organic products for for example fancy restaurants in Amman also, they decided to renovate some of the stone houses, which very often still remembered the Ottomans, and gave them back to the people so they can start building little hotels. So tourism was introduced and very soon some of the locals started becoming guides in the reserve. There are plenty of trails for hiking there. Some would even go to universities and become scientists mostly dealing with preservation of nature. So they started taking care of the nature around them. Within 20 years what was a dead village became a success story. Life came back, at least officially. What you see around you, well we are off the main street of the village and its ruins. I would say more than 50% of the villas are actually ruined and honestly when we started looking for places to stay for the night prices were high and um, the sensation we had quality was not. So maybe 20 years ago it was a success story but I'm kind of thinking maybe they need a um, kind of a new spark to rekindle the old success or maybe that's our sensation because of the weather and the fog and everything. Anyway, who had such an amazing idea to revive the village and to protect nature? Royal Society for the Conservation of Nature, RSCN, those guys we met in episode 1 already. Of course, they are here as well. And I think this was one of their first projects in Dana exactly and the first project that worked or even um, worked better than intended. So now we are coming towards their base. Of course per RSCN plenty of things here. There's a little museum about the bioreserve. There are some workshops, there are shops, there's a little hotel and some pretty awesome art. 
but maybe most important detail for us right now it is built right next to a sheer cliff so the terrace of the complex has some amazing views of the whole bioreserve of the whole wadi which of course we are not going to get right well this is our good karma just as we arrived this was the moment the fog just for a moment lifted and that is what we saw enjoy impressive right well it's a bit more impressive when the weather is good and the sun is out anyway we're not complaining because within not even a minute the fog came back and that was that so guess what let's say goodbye to Dana and actually we are going to go straight into a topic which was supposed to be for the next episode but now we are just an hour north of Dana in a little place called Al Mazar. The place may be little, but there's a huge complex. I don't even know how to call it a mosque or what, but it's a huge complex around actually very small mausoleums. But those mausoleums are to some very important people who died here more than a thousand years ago. One especially turns out nearby was the first confrontation between the Byzantine Empire and Islam it is the year 629 it's only seven years after the Hijra so when Muhammad escaped from Mecca to Medina seven years only and the first incursion of Islam reached the Byzantine Empire it was not a success not only that the army was defeated but also the main generals died three among them were especially important one among the three was crucial Zayed bin Haritha so adopted son of Mohammed himself and this is the mausoleum in, to him well I think it's kind of obvious if we have such a person actually in Christian terms we can call him Apostle one of the very first people who converted to Islam one of the very first Muslims so for the Muslim people here such an important person obviously there is going to be today a huge complex built around the mausoleum and that fact alone is already reason enough to stop here but there is another reason it's not simply confrontation between islam and byzantine empire that was the first contact and confrontation between christianity and islam the story is going to come back in a second turns out there was a third reason to stop here we found here the camel our favorite piece of street art in jordan and mind you if it wasn't for the mausoleum we would never have seen it it is truly a masterpiece look for the artist his name is Ernesto Maranje you will find him on Instagram uh, give him a like please so that was great experience of course visiting mausoleum also was a great experience unfortunately something wasn't you have this beautiful modern complex uh, state of the art and so on and so forth and then right next to it that is what you see it is rather sad anyway let's get back on track as mentioned Al Mazar is witness to the first confrontation between Christianity and Islam the first but not the last here we are entering Al Karak which is basically the unofficial capital of southern Jordan and of course the place is already mentioned in the Old Testament it was also a famous place during Byzantine times so back in the previous episode we were in Umm al Rasas in church of Saint Stephen with all the beautiful mosaics including some towns of the region unfortunately the way the passageways were laid out it's very difficult to see so here it is upside down but it is here as Karak Moba 
the fortress of Moab and it is actually known today for a fortress but from a different time late 11th century the famous crusades begin and here it is in Karak where you will find one of the best preserved and most famous till the very day castles of the crusaders and my god you do see it when you arrive not only because it is actually on a steep hill but also it's simply huge it dominates also the modern town it is till the very day the biggest most uh, splendorous building in the city even by the 21st century standards so let's hop up and yeah you can see we are on a steep uh, high hill we were there a moment ago on the road back at the bottom unfortunately because of the weather staying um, on the terrace is not exactly the best of ideas so let's go straight into the castle just having a quick look before we enter at the thick walls built on solid rock my god those crusaders let's go in now and let's see some more of it and yeah the wind is strong again we are on a very high steep hill but those crusaders isn't it amazing how they would build well what you're seeing in front of you the wall is mostly built by crusaders but for example the terrace this kind of gallery that we are going to walk through in a second those are the egyptian mamluks yep do not forget please this place has three thousand years of history crusaders were here for 46 and yes they left behind quite a lot but it's only 46 years there were people here before them and after them as well so once again the wall you're seeing is mostly built by crusaders but then it was rebuilt and amplified a hundred years later by the egyptian mamluks and then it was also a garrison during the ottoman times and they also kept adding things so actually it's only 19th century modernity when uh, life left the karak castle but of course there were people here before already 3000 years ago moab understood very well what an important place this is there must have been some kind of a fortress or a temple here this is a piece of a monumental door there should be a lion on it unfortunately not very visible showing it anyway so if there were monumental door there must have been a temple or a fortress or maybe both because Moab already understood one thing there are amazing views from here especially one view see the cloud which kind of springs out from the ground then it was gone and we saw it there in the background is the Dead Sea so here you see and control one of the best ways to access the Dead Sea from the east and you also control the road south-north or north-south whatever so you control pretty much everything that's moving east of the Dead Sea. Hence not only Moab but any culture that came after them understood how an important place this is. There must have been always some kind of a fortress. Look at the time uh, of the Byzantines. Fortress of Moab is the name of the town. And of course Crusaders when they came here they thought of it as well so now we are going up the stairs to enter the part of the castle which was let's call it delineated by the crusaders the proper area of the crusader castle now they started building this castle not long after they appeared meaning late 11th century they take jerusalem 40 years later they start building the karak castle already so officially 1142 and it took 20 years in 62 it is ready and it's controlling two important things it's controlling access between cairo damascus and mecca so not only military movement economical movement but also pilgrimages to mecca are controlled from here so we're at the top and guess what the fort you're seeing in the background was built by the egyptian mamluks we are going down now 
into what probably was kind of a little crusader palace, which was then repurposed by the Mamluks again. So in the end, we are in a crusader castle where there is hardly anything left from the time of the crusaders, right? Well, the most important thing in the end that they did, they kind of set the limits for the castle as such. But I guess uh, it's kind of boring who did what and where and when. No more military or architectural details. Let's just go through it because there is of course information here and there and everything, but this place is not prepared for tourism the Western way. It is, um, it's kind of free, I would say. There's quite a lot of liberty when it comes to discovering all the nooks and crannies. Plus, supposedly, what we see is only 20-30% of the castle. And not because they don't let us see more, it's because most of it is still undiscovered. There are supposedly seven levels. If we go down to the last one, we go down to Moab 3000 years ago. So let's investigate what we can and a bit of commentary in the meantime. First of all, when the castle here is finished, it becomes capital of a principality of, in French, Ultra Jordan, or something like that. In other words, Princedom of Transjordan. And it is a big ironical twist, especially for the people who live here today, that the first time that a country exists named Princedom of Transjordan, it was a small crusader state. Basically, when the crusaders came here, they copy-pasted Western European feudalism. So you had the Kingdom of Jerusalem plus plenty of little vassal states, semi-independent. And this principality, Princedom of Transjordan, was one of them. So there were quite a lot of important people here. And maybe the most famous today was the last, some people say, responsible for the fall of the princedom itself. One Reynald de Châtillon. Well, his story actually begins as no big deal. He's a second son of a lord. Back in the day, you don't really have many opportunities. So he joined the Second Crusade, 1147, he comes to Jerusalem. He gets lucky very soon, a number of years, he's up in Antioch, the widow of the ruler fell in love with him, bam, he is the ruler of Antioch itself. Very soon, turns out, kind of an aggressive ruler. He was waging wars against all his neighbors, be it Muslim or Christian. So, within several years, when, when he is finally caught by the Muslim ruler of Aleppo, nobody wants to pay ransom, and he stayed 15 years imprisoned. Finally released, finally ransom was paid, 1175, he is in Jerusalem again, and guess what? Again gets lucky, again a widow, Stephanie, wife of the late Lord of Karak. Hence again through marriage he becomes Lord of Karak himself. Let's say Prince of Transjordan even, one of the most important people within the Crusader circles. And again, just like before, he turns out to be an aggressive ruler. For example, every now and then he would harass the pilgrimages to Mecca and even he started piracy in the Red Sea. 1183, his fleet sunk in the Red Sea, a pilgrimage to Mecca. There was an outrage in the Muslim world. One guy called Salah ad-Din, known as Saladin in English, he said he will take vengeance, personally killing Reynald. So the same year he besieged Karak, and the next year again, but this is a huge strong castle and it withstood both of the sieges. Saladin gets lucky, Three years later, 1187, Hattin, a huge battle, lost by the Crusaders completely. He caught many of the leaders, released them all, minus one. According to tradition at least, he kept his word, literally with his own hand, decapitated Reynald. Stephanie widowed again, 
promised Saladin the castle for the release of her son, but the knights inside had a different idea and they decided to fight. It took eight months and as usual, not through assault, but through hunger, finally Saladin conquered it. 1188 Karak Castle is in his hands. Now the image I used for Reynald is from the film Kingdom of Heaven and there he is shown uh, kind of typically as more a bandit than an actual knight. He is, I guess, the main villain of the film actually. But there is a second theory. Saladin hated him so much because he was the only one who realized how dangerous Saladin is. Saladin wanted to encircle the Crusaders and supposedly Reynald was one of the few who were trying to fight against encirclement, for example by raiding caravans. Hence the ire of Saladin and not only his ire. Most of what we know about Reynald comes from Muslim chroniclers who were obviously not very happy with him either. In the end, whatever the case, Reynald has his own little place in history now. But we are going to start saying slowly goodbye to both the castle and the town, which unfortunately we did not have time to see. Just like in case of the north, here two extra days would have been perfect. But we didn't have them, we actually had only two, three hours to visit the castle only. And the weather did not accompany us, so in the end I'm afraid to say we were not very lucky with Karak. But I guess it cannot always be perfect, can it, right? The next day, escaping the winds and rains and fogs of Dana, we are going south towards another castle from the time of the Crusades. And pretty much like in the case of Karak, the approach is amazing. You have another high steep hill with the castle on top of it. And you can see from afar already the thick walls and the big towers. But unlike in Karak, the surrounding is a bit different. You don't have a quiet big modern town. You have a semi-abandoned village. And that's one thing that makes the climate different, plus literally the climate is different. There's no greenery around here anymore. It is all pretty much a semi-desert. I would say the nature here is a bit more inhospitable. And actually, that whole setting made us think. Look what you have today. It is 21st century and the road is very narrow. As you saw a moment ago, it's kind of even difficult to pass a another car. And that's the case today. Imagine 900 years ago. Imagine all those knights coming from, from places like France, Germany, England. They come here. To be honest, we driving up the hill now, we feel kind of alien here like we don't really belong to the place. So imagine those guys 900 years ago, how they must have felt when they came to a place which looks so different to their homes. And we were just thinking, were they really convinced that they are here to reclaim the Holy Land from the hands of the infidels? Or were they thinking, what the hell did we just get ourselves into? Anyway, here we are, almost at the top of the hill and about to visit a castle which the Crusaders called Mont Real, the Royal Mountain, but today it is called through the name of a nearby village, Shobak. Here's the visitor center, but we're gonna go straight towards the castle and Pretty much like in Kerak, again amazing views. Look at how the clouds play with the light. Look at this hill. It's like somebody made 30 crepes and put one on top of another. Anyway, as we approach, again we have beautiful uh, thick walls and again they're not really crusader. What you see here are again the Egyptian Mamluks. And this time I can easily prove it. Look at the top of the tower, this alphabet is not Latin, is it? 
and again pretty much like in the case of Karak the main um, area of the castle was set by the Crusaders but it was later amplified by the Egyptian Mamluks now Montreal is the first castle built by the Crusaders east of the Dead Sea 1099 they grab Jerusalem 16 years later they are here already and started building it so when Montreal was finished it became the original capital of the Principality of Transjordan only, only later it was moved to Karak which is more suited uh, for it but then Montreal was also the last to fall several months after Karak did and it's all fine and dandy but here there is even less to see than in Karak this place is truly half ruined anyway we are going to investigate because it may serve as background for a very important issue the Crusades as such because in theory it is nothing special it is one of many invasions that the Levant and the Near East suffered and actually one of the impulses to even start the Crusades was a different invasion one of the emperors of the Byzantine Empire asked the West to help against the Seljuk Turks so in theory Crusaders invading the Near East is nothing new. In practice though, for both sides, very important moment. When it comes to Western Europe, it is several decades after the schism, when the Latin Church, the Catholic Church, finally separated from the Greek, from the Orthodox. And actually soon it starts even um, surpassing in terms of culture the Byzantine Empire. It is the moment when the so-called High Middle Ages begin and, for example, some of the monuments they started building at that time remain emblematic till the very day. But maybe most important of all, it is the time when uh, some administrative structures begin being created, which today are big, important national states. So it is, in a way, a formative moment for what is Western Europe today. When it comes to Arab Islamic Near Eastern world, that's the very last moment of their golden age. It is during the Crusades, or me maybe even because of the Crusades, that the last great hero appeared. The person who started the last, let's call them, the last Arab dynasty of the United Near East, governing Cairo, Damascus and Mecca. And I think those are the main reasons why the time of the Crusades, it's not simply another invasion, it is a clash of civilizations which were, each one in their own way, but which were in a very important moment of their history. Hence, I wouldn't say that the Crusades are alive in the minds of the people, but it is a topic which kind of raises emotions, both in Western Europe and the Near East. And when it comes to Europe, maybe the best example is tourism today. Mind you, there is nothing here. You can see it's basically um, heaps of uh, rubble. The best structures that still stand were actually built by the Egyptian Mamluks a hundred years after Crusaders were here. Yet still, it is here to this random shithole lost in the middle of some half desert hills south of the Dead Sea that busloads of tourists come. And when it comes to busloads in Karak, you can hardly walk. There are so many of them there. Honestly, we have enough of the fog and the rain and the winds that want to rip our heads off. And because of the wind, it's cold. Look at Vicky. She's dressed like for winter. And we have enough of Eurocentrism. Oh man, I wish we could visit the castle in the sun. <gasps> what has just happened? What is this amazing magic that brought us again to the beautiful green sunny north? And can it be? Is that at the top of the hill a castle? A castle that we can actually visit in the sun? Well, welcome to Ajlun. 
And yes, it is not only a castle, but it's actually a castle which still stands. Maybe it's not as sprawling as the other two, but it's actually here, not ruined. And there are plenty of people around us who are local. Maybe they are here because it is a Saturday. Or maybe they are here because this is a castle from the time of the Crusades, but it's not built by Crusaders. It was built by Muslims. <gasps> what? Muslims built castles as well? Oh yeah, they do, and they actually do it well. Here we are in a something we can call a Barbican. This is the main gate. There should be at least one proper iron crate here. And then as we enter, well... I had this idea that if this is a proper castle standing and it's properly prepared for tourism, here you have a very good example how modern it is. There are some lights and there's TV and there's a gentleman telling people in the local lingo actually, which is very much appreciated, something interesting. And there's actually a good plan for the castle, so I thought, if that's the case, here we are going to visit it properly and I can tell you what was where and how things worked well. I got lost after five minutes, even with a good plan, as this place is pure architectural chaos. And no wonder, for several hundred years it's been built and rebuilt, and then, in 19th century, it was reconstructed. I'm not sure what was their scientific approach. It might have been, I like it that way, I'm gonna do it that way. So, all I can tell you is this. In front of you, you have cannonballs, which means there were things like um, workshops here and warehouses. The basic soldiers lived on the ground level. The higher you go, the more important it becomes. First floor, you had, for example, the um, representative dining room and the villas for the officers were on the second floor. This space is supposedly a little slave market, which is actually an interesting detail. So I guess what we're gonna do, I'm gonna continue the tradition of walking around and visiting and some commentary in the background. Why is it so chaotic? Well, it's an onion. Let's start with 1184. Saladin gave order and one of his cousins starts building. A simple fortress actually, a square with four towers in the corners. And the idea was to keep vigil against Karak, which was to the south, but also another castle was across the Jordan to the west, a castle called Belvoir. This castle wasn't actually built as much for defense as for giving signs, either with uh, smoke or um, fire, if there is a crusader raid approaching. But when it is finished, it is 1187 and both Karak and Belvoir are in Saladin's hands. But it is here and they keep amplifying it after the death of Saladin it becomes, for example, one of the centers for breeding and training postal pigeons, as here we are roughly between Cairo and Damascus, so it is kind of a perfect spot, and I have to admit that the pigeons are actually still around, but I think that those do not carry post, those simply carry diseases. Well, I don't know about the pigeons, but I can tell you this. The idea of amplifying the fortress turned out to be right. Another invasion of the Near East comes from the Mongols. Yep, they didn't only invade Eastern Central Europe, they came here as well. Castle was besieged, taken, then retaken quickly. The most important thing it did though, it slowed down the Mongols' advance. So, proved the point of its existence. Hence, it was later repaired and again amplified by the Mamluks. And later, during the Ottoman times, there was a garrison, there was actually even a school here. So, till late 18th, beginning of the 19th century, it did have life, which means every several generations something else is added, repurposed, hence the chaos. But now let's move to a person who keeps appearing all the time. We know him through his nickname, actually, Salahaddin, 
so we know him as Saladin. Oh, I'm not going to tell you much about him now, because he's such a fascinating person, he deserves a separate episode. Let me just use him as background for a thing or two. First of all, back in the day, it is Islam that was an invader of the Near East. So yes, invasion means war, but then, as mentioned in the previous episode, there was plenty of intercultural change between Christianity, the Byzantine version, and Islam. And a very similar thing happens here during the Crusades. Well, yes, there was war, but first of all, it wasn't simply Muslims versus Christians. Sometimes it was Muslims versus Muslims. For example, Saladin was Sunni. In Egypt, he replaced the Fatimids who were Shia. And mind you, the Shia never forgot. He was twice almost assassinated by the famous, well, assassins. I'm not even gonna tell you about the Christian Game of Thrones in Jerusalem because that was typical of feudal Europe of that time. So as you can see, more complicated the story here, but it wasn't only war, there was also peace and actually there were years of prolonged peace between the two sides. So there was plenty of cultural exchange as well and a very good example is where we are right now. Muslims started learning from Christians how to build castles and as Christians back in the day would do it better and Christians would learn from Muslims one of the things they learned hygiene in a moment you are going to see a bath there was running water here there was a sewage system which a thousand years ago was most definitely not the norm in the west of Europe one more important thing most probably came to Europe during the Crusades, about it I'm gonna tell you in a future episode. And here we go back to Saladin again. Already during his time, the Christian chroniclers would consider Saladin an ideal ruler. No Christian, but a Muslim was considered an ideal ruler that Christian lords should aspire to uh, emulate. There is, for example, a story from one of the Saladin's sieges of Karak. Turns out the son of Stephanie was having a wedding. So she sent food uh, to the Muslim army and then Saladin asked in which tower the newlyweds will spend the night, told his army not to bomb that particular tower. Is that story true or not? Actually, doesn't matter. What matters is such stories about Saladin's chivalry circulated already back during his time. And till today he is a part of not only history but the legendarium of both the Christian Europe and the Muslim Near East as an ideal ruler. And I think today the best example of his fame among the Muslims, they are convinced it is Saladin who created the famous hummus, which is of course not true, as he had other things on his mind than inventing something that probably existed in the region for thousands of years already. Anyway, I think it is not a sunny Saturday, it is his fame that brings so many locals here. It is a castle that is built by Muslims at the time of Saladin. And I think there's one more thing that attracts them here, as you can see from the very top, amazing views, 360 degrees. And this is it. This is the ironical twist of the story. The most beautiful, the best kept castle from the time of the Crusades was not built by Crusaders, but by Saladin and the local Muslims. And what a great place it is. I think we're gonna spend a bit more time here. No, no, not here again with this horrible wind and the cold. You know what? We have had enough of crusaders, winds and castles. So we are going to leave Montreal Velshobak behind and if the magic is gone we cannot go back to the north again we are heading straight south towards the Red Sea in search of the Sun we are going straight towards the city of 
Akaba. And guess what's waiting for us there? What's waiting is sun, heat and this beautiful entrance. It reminds me of Miami or something. I can hear the music from Miami Vice there in the back of my head. And if you think that's pretty awesome, well, when we arrive at the sea itself, the sunset is waiting for us. And what a sunset it is. The place is so beautiful that even me, with zero talent when it comes to taking photos, my photos here are amazing. This is nothing. Look at this. It looks like it's been photoshopped. If you have any doubts if it's me or not, it is me. This is my talent in Akaba. Thank you very much. We were very happy. We were very content. So I think in our next episode, we are going to walk around Akaba a bit to get a better feel for it. But actually, we need to finish this episode first. And we're gonna finish it with an extra bit of craziness. We already passed through today through a number of climatic changes. We actually magically went all the way to the green beautiful north, but on the way to Akaba we went out of this world. Welcome to Mars. Enjoy. Yes, yes, we are going to walk around Akaba, but first and foremost, we are going to finally visit one of the official highlights of Jordan. So for the moment, thank you very much for your attention and see you on Mars itself.